In university, you take a computer-aided design class that asks you to model this part based on its 2D drawing in SOLIDWORKS, Creo, or whatever CAD software your school uses. And while there are a million different ways to constrain features, define relations, build your models, and still arrive at a visually correct result, there's only a handful of methods that actually reflect proper design intent. It's these nuances and subtle differences that schools don't teach teach and what separate a great mechanical engineer from a mediocre one. In my experience, many fresh grads and even experienced mechanical engineers are oblivious to good design practices and proper design intent, which leads to a lot of unneeded frustration, massive project delays, and budget overruns throughout the product development process. A lot of design mistakes don't show up until you're deep into manufacturing, testing, or assembly, and basically when it's too late and expensive to fix. So in this video, I want to walk through the most common design mistakes that I see engineers making and how you can avoid them in your designs and projects. The first category of mistakes is design intent and CAD best practices. These are mistakes that affect how your CAD model behaves, rebuilds, and evolves when dimensions are modified. Mistake number one is poor feature referencing. If your entire model or assembly falls apart or crashes every time you go to update a feature, then there's probably no design intent baked in. So one of the simplest examples I can give is how you create and dimension a hole in a block. The hole can be a certain distance from a corner or edge, or it can be in the middle of the face. There's really no right or wrong answer. It completely depends on what the hole needs to do as the design evolves. If it has to stay centered no matter the size, constrain it to the midpoint. If it needs to be fixed a certain distance from the edge for a screw or connector, dimension from the edge. The key is to match your modeling to your design intent. You really need to anticipate how your design will change in the future and define dimensions and relations based on that. Avoid anchoring features to center lines and features like edges that might move or disappear later. Remember to use construction lines, patterns, and mirror features to keep things consistent and smart. The second mistake is an extension of the first one and it's not incorporating parametric thinking. Hard coding dimensions everywhere makes your part fragile and tedious to update. Nope. Use global variables, link values, and equations so your designs can adapt and scale as requirements change. To give an example, imagine you have a 100 by 60 millimeter plate. You draw each hole and dimension it manually, 10 millimeters from the X edge and 10 millimeters from the Y edge, and you call out the diameter. That's three dimensions per hole. If you later want to change the plate to say 150 by 90 millimeters, you have to edit 12 dimensions manually. Instead, the preferred way is to set global variables. So plate length equals 100 millimeters. The plate width equals 60 millimeters. The edge offset equals 10 millimeters and the hole diameter equals five millimeters. Then sketch the plate and link the dimensions to the global variables we define plate length and plate width. Next, we can create holes by sketching a hole in the top or bottom corner. Link it to the global parameter hole diameter and constrain its position with the global variable edge offset from the X and Y edges. Then draw two center lines through the midpoint of the plate. Mirror the circles about both center lines to get four symmetrical holes. Now, if the plate size changes or you want to shift the holes to 15 millimeters from the edges or change hole size, just change the global variables and equations and the whole design updates automatically. Now, in the following example, one hole is fixed, one is driven by an equation, and the other two are mirrored. As the size of the hinge changes, the holes remain properly spaced along the length and width. Now, when you're designing real products like an iPhone, jet engine, or car, there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands of parts and hundreds of thousands to millions of dimensions, relations, and constraints. Failure to account for design intent from the start will make your life hell down the road. Your model will behave unpredictably every time you go to update because it wasn't built with the underlying purpose or constraints in mind. Mistake number three is 
overdefined and underdefined sketches. A sketch that is arbitrarily locked down or left floating is going to rear its ugly head during rebuilds. Use meaningful constraints like equal length, concentricity, and symmetry that reflect how the part should behave. A well-defined sketch should have just enough constraints to reflect your design intent. Now, if we only dimension one side of a rectangle, it's underdefined. And if you drag a corner, it moves and is unstable. Overdefining is when you, for example, dimension both sides and then you set both sides equal. Now the software is confused. Should it be a square or rectangle? Mistake number four is neglecting feature tree organization. A messy feature tree is just like bad code. It works until you need to go edit or debug it later. The feature tree is essentially your parts timeline. It records every sketch, extrusion, cut, fillet, hole, draft, and pattern in the order they were created. So many engineers add features out of order, use poor naming conventions like Boss Extrude 37, and include random unnecessary sketches and broken features. It really becomes a nightmare when you or someone else revisits the file weeks or months later. To have an organized feature tree, it's best to rename features such that your tree is readable at a glance. Use self-explanatory names like Boss, Main Body, Cut USB, slot and sketch mounting holes. To prevent catastrophic rebuild errors and getting locked out of editing core shapes, it's critical to model features in a specific and logical sequence. First, you want to model base features whether using boss extrude, revolve, and or sweep and lock functions. This is the foundation of your model. Everything else is built on or removed from this shape. If you get this wrong, the entire model becomes unstable. Second, you want to work on major additive and subtractive features like shells that hollow out the body, bosses, ribs, flanges, and any large cutouts. These features define the functional geometry or the space needed to meet mechanical or space requirements. Adding them early allows you to draft, pattern, or manipulate them before any fine detail work begins. Third, include drafts to faces, features, and extrusions in your part if there are any. Drafts are required for manufacturing processes like injection molding and casting so the part can be ejected from the mold. So you want drafts before any detailed features like holes or fillets to prevent geometry distortion, keep rebuilds clean, and avoid broken edges from downstream references. Fourth are holes, counterbores, pockets, slots, notches, etc. These are functional details that rely on the core geometry. Adding them after drafts ensures that faces and edges are final and won't shift due to molding considerations. Next, add any feature patterns, be it holes, cuts, bosses, or pockets after you've perfected the things you are duplicating. Last but not least are cosmetic features, including fillets, chamfers, edge breaks, screw threads, logos, and text emboss and debosses. Save the pretty stuff for last. Applying things like fillets too early can make downstream features harder to sketch on, cause face ID changes and broken references, and complicate shelling, drafts, and cuts. Now the second category of mistakes is designed for manufacture and assembly or DFMA. As the name implies, these mistakes make the design harder, slower, or more expensive to manufacture and assemble. Now DFMA is massive. It's a whole philosophy that touches every aspect of product development, but I'll try to cover some of the most common mistakes that engineers make in this video. The first mistake is ignoring tolerances. Too many engineers either leave default tolerances from the title block and assume they're good enough or slap on 10 thousandths of a millimeter or very tight GD&T symbols. This leads to parts failing inspection despite being functionally okay, skyrocketing costs due to tight machining or inspection requirements, delays and redesigns when parts don't fit together on the assembly line. There are different tolerance standards like ISO 2768 and ISO 286 for fine medium and coarse tolerance classes that serve as a good starting point. You want to assign tolerances based on functional requirements. Only give tighter appropriate tolerances to critical features like press fits or alignment holes. For non-critical features like aesthetic cutouts or logo areas, call out looser tolerances to save money and time. For every dimension, ask what happens if the feature is half a millimeter off. If the answer is nothing, loosen it more. Be sure to collaborate with 
with machinists, suppliers, and leverage tolerance analysis tools in CAD to validate stack ups. If we look at this graph for CNC machining, costs go up exponentially as tolerances are made tighter. Also, another point I want to make is that the old fashioned way is to slap plus minus tolerances on every dimension. There's nothing wrong with that, but it creates a square tolerance zone, which doesn't make sense for holes because they're round. Why should their centers be combined to a square? This drives up manufacturing costs without improving performance. To solve this geometric dimension, and tolerancing recognizes this problem and introduces a type of tolerance called true position, which allows for a three-dimensional circular tolerance zone and can therefore lead to a part being cheaper to manufacture. I'll very likely make a separate video about tolerances in the future because it definitely deserves one. Now, before we continue, one of my favorite platforms that was essential in teaching me how to think like an engineer was Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Video. It helps you get smarter every day with thousands of hands-on lessons in math, physics, data analysis, programming, and AI. Brilliant breaks down problems using a first principles approach. Their lessons develop problem-solving skills by allowing you to experiment with concepts. This method is proven to be six times more effective than traditional lecture-based learning. Brilliant's lessons are crafted by professors, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, and Google, so you learn from the best. Brilliant promotes critical thinking through active learning, not memorization, so you become a strong problem solver. It also helps promote the habit of daily learning essential for both personal and professional growth. Brilliant interactive bite-sized lessons allow you to learn on the go and make the most of your time. One of my favorites is Brilliant's scientific thinking course that teaches you to think like an engineer as you design gear systems, bridges, and electric circuits. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash engineering gone wild or scan a QR code on the screen or you can check out the link in the description below. You also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Now mistake number two is forgetting about manufacturing constraints. You can design anything in CAD but it's useless if it can't be made. Engineers often create features that look fine in CAD but are a nightmare to machine, mold, or fabricate. Common offenders include sharp internal corners which concentrate stress and are difficult to manufacture because most tools like end mills are round. Then there's deep narrow holes that are very hard to drill, cause chatter, and can lead to tool breakage. Undercuts and injection molding, casting, and even CNC machining require special setups and tools like side actions and T-cutters. Then there's impossible tool paths for CNC machining due to very tight spaces or steep walls in designs. Each manufacturer Manufacturing has an extensive set of rules and best practices that you should follow. But in general, all your designs need to respect the constraints of processes, tooling, and materials. Mistake number three seems obvious, but you'd be surprised by how many engineers commit it. And that's using non-standard hole sizes and fasteners. Designing a 4.3 millimeter hole that requires a custom drill bit or using 23 different screw types across a product makes manufacturing sourcing and assembly a pain. Depending on the application, choose a limited fastener family if you can, like socket head cap screws between M3 to M6 range. Also ensure that holes match fit type standards like clearance, tap, and press fit. Mistake number four is simple but overlooked. Disregarding tool access or assembly clearance. If a screwdriver, socket, or torque wrench can't reach it, it's not going together. Design with the assembly sequence in mind and and add enough clearance for the tools that your technicians will use. Mistake number five is the parts have no locating features or requires too many hands or fixtures to assemble. If it takes three people in a custom jig to hold parts in place while tightening bolts, then that's a bad design. Aim for self-locating parts and designs incorporating pins, bosses, tabs, or other features that give the assembler a way to put parts together quickly and accurately. Lastly, mistake number six is your part can can't be disassembled for repair or maintenance. Add access panels, modular sub-assemblies, and captive screws so the product lives longer and is easier and cheaper to service and maintain. Now, I'll close by saying that I hope this video is able to help you avoid all of these design mistakes and streamline your engineering projects. When designing, the devil 
rule is in the details and one bad assumption or overlooked constraint can delay a project by weeks and cost thousands of dollars to fix. All right, guys, that's it for today. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, be sure to check out my video here where I talk about how I doubled my engineering salary in three years and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.